Thank you very much for taking the time today to view our video. Before we begin, we'd like to take a moment to introduce ourselves. There are many aspects to 9.connect, but it boils down to the fact that we're a PCB-centric organization. We believe and focus on the PCB due to the fact that it is truly the center point of all electronic design. That's where our expertise lies. We provide services not only in the PCB layout, but in design consulting as well. And during the technical portion of this webinar, you will see this expertise in motion. We are now the exclusive North American instructors for Altium Designer. We host 100 trainings throughout the year across North America, and we are excited to bring these trainings closer to you. In addition to our services, we are also a value-added reseller for a number of PCB-related software companies. And just to note, each company has been presented in past webinars. So if you're interested in them, please contact us or check out our website. And by the way, we provide one-on-one -on -one coaching for these tools as well. For more information on our services and past webinars, please contact us. Our information is listed in the description below. Thank you for giving us a moment of your time, and please enjoy the presentation. Today we're going to talk about the first part of the library series. We have uh, this one this week, and then the one next week. And just to give you kind of a quick uh, overview of what we're going to do, this week I'm going to talk about the elements of library structure. And it might surprise you uh, what I'm going to talk about today. It may have never really dawned on you the, um, the criticality of certain aspects of the library, and we're going to go into that pretty deep today. Next week is a tour of the libraries, and I would highly recommend that even though you may already have a library established at your company or you've got a certain type of library, you may still want to see it just to see what other offerings Altium has. I'm pretty much going to go through and summarize all the libraries. I call it the tour of the libraries. I'm going to go into each one, show their capabilities, and also kind of discuss their advantages and disadvantages as well. So I think it's kind of important for me to give a little bit of background because uh, I kind of think to myself, how did I get here? In the, in the aspect of libraries, because when I started off as an electrical engineer, I never thought of myself uh, taking a keen interest in this whole thing. But actually, my, my start in, in libraries started back in 2007. I was actually hired on by Altium to be an FPGA expert for their support team. Um, however, as the cases came in, I started to grab more of the library support cases. And over time, I realized that a lot of our customers didn't know what type of libraries Altium had, so I created something called a tour of libraries. And in fact, I'm going to kind of be doing that next week. It's going to be very similar to the one I created many years ago, just that Altium's added more offerings since then. And I used to do it for the sales team. Well, ultimately, the tour of libraries became a two-day library training, which I helped develop with a few other colleagues of mine, and it's still something that they make available to this day. After I left Altium in 2011, there were two companies that called me up saying we need some help with our configuration management, which is a nice way of saying they need help with their libraries. And I worked for a very small company, and I worked for a rather relatively large company, so I got a lot of experience implementing libraries and seeing the process flow uh, and how the libraries interact with the design process flow. So that's my background on this. So I'm going to be giving you a little bit more insight on this than just taking it from a tool perspective. Now, I found that when we deal with these type of topics, I really need to give you what I call the angle of perspective. I want to give you guys a perspective from a different point of view that you may have not have thought of because it shows where I'm coming from and it shows what you need to kind of, the, the way you need to approach it. And the first angle of perspective is the way I look at libraries is that it's like building a dam, that you've got to think about it and you've got to build it right the first time when there's no water behind it, as you can see in this picture over here. Because once the water is being pushed over here, being held back, and you've got the hydroelectronics working to create electricity, and it's creating a reservoir for people to have their water and so on and so forth, it's really difficult to fix that. You really can't just drain it out and say, well, we're going to make some repairs to that. That impacts a lot, of the, a lot of people. And that's the exact same thing that happens with the library. You really have to know what the structure is going to be before you start. You really can't ad hoc it, because once that library is in place, uh, any interruptions to that library will interrupt the design process. So that's the first angle of perspective. The second one is that I've always looked at libraries as being a garden. And as you know, here's a perfect garden. It's a garden that we all want to have in our own backyard. It's you know, well fertilized. It's being well taken care for. It's, it's very aesthetic to look at, very pleasing to look at. And yet what I find in most companies is that this picture over here, and this is me probably, oh, this is not a picture of me, but this is how I feel when I'm dealing with the library. 
here is something that something got set up a while ago. There was an effort to put a library together, but it's been abandoned, and as a result, it just kind of grows wild along with the weeds. And so maybe a lot of you feel like this. This poor guy over here is looking at this massive yard, saying, wow, look at everything I've got to accomplish. And that's the same thing that happens in our libraries as well. So a library does require a, an individual to maintain it. It will never maintain itself. I should say never, but currently with the processes and the technologies we have, someone has to maintain the library. It just will not maintain itself. It's just like a vegetable garden. So those are the two angles of perspective I want to give you for the libraries. Now, also, I'm going to kind of start off kind of simple, and, and I'm going to be taking this in probably an approach you never thought of before, but bear with me on this. There's two types of libraries out there. One of them is what you call a symbol-centric library. So you have a symbol here, you have footprints, you have signal integrity, you could even have a spice model. They all point to the same part in the SCH Lib library. That's why I call it symbol-centric. If you look it up, no one calls it that. It's just my term for it. But what it means is that everything starts in the symbol library. They all link to everything in the symbol library. And as a matter of fact, for a historical note, prior to Altium Designer 6.8, all the 3D stuff used to be even included in here as well. And then finally in 6.8, they realized that there were orientation issues, so they actually put the 3D with the footprint. But for the longest time, they purposely put the 3D model with the symbol because they wanted everything to connect to the symbol. They were very tight on that methodology until they realized the uh, limitations of it. Okay, let's go over here. <coughs> Excuse me. The second type is the database library. And I'm actually a big fan of database libraries and I'll show more about this next week. Uh, the reason why is that you have a lot of flexibility, you get a lot of reuse. So if you have 10,000 capacitors, for example, and they're all using the same symbol, you only have to draw the symbol once. So there's a big efficiency gain by using uh, database libraries. But basically in a database library, you can have as many columns as you want, and that's what Altium calls parameters. And I'm going to call it intelligent data, and you'll see why as I continue along here. On the row over here, you have uh, basically your components. So each and every single row is a component, and it depends on what you want to put in there. Altium requires a minimal amount of information. It wants a part number. It wants a library reference, which is your symbol where it's located, the footprint in its symbol as well. Okay? And anything else that you add to it just adds more intelligent data, and you'll see why we want that data in there in just a few moments. Okay, So those are the two different libraries that Altium has. And by the way, for this uh, demonstration, whether you're using what I'll call the symbol-centric library or using a database library, uh, everything I'm going to show you today is applicable to either type of library. And by the way, as far as I know, I've, I've, been primarily, I've worked in other tools in the past, but pretty much the two different libraries they showed are the same ones that almost all EDA companies use. Okay, they're either going to do a database library or they're going to do a symbol-centric library, and I don't really even know of a third type. Some people may claim that the vault is yet a third type, but yet the vault is really a glorified database. So let's get on to this over here. Who does the library serve? It kind of maybe sound like a silly question, but I think the problem that we've had in the past is that we've always focused in the libraries on the designer. And the designer needs certain things, certainly like characteristic data and it's very static over here. Now, also there's the purchasers, and a lot of times we forget about the purchasers, but they actually play a major role in these things as well. And what's interesting about this, there is an overlap of interest of data. The problem that you got over here is that the designers like static data, and the data that we normally put in is characteristic data, okay, and this characteristic data is going to be the same whether it's tomorrow, next week, or 10 years from now. It's characteristic data that's always going to remain the same. The purchasers, however, because they work in the marketplace, they're dealing with a lot of fluctuations. Lead times are changing, quantities are changing, the life cycles are changing. Even the verification of the part can change over time, especially if you're in Mel Aero or in the medical uh, field. So they're dealing with dynamic data, and it may not be of choice, it's just that's the environment that they work in. So when we're dealing with the library, we really got to think of both the designer and the purchaser. Okay? So what are the features of a good library? It might surprise you to find that we're always focusing down over here and the symbols and the footprints and the 3Ds, not the 3D library and all this other good stuff. And that's certainly necessary to have a good design. But what I want us to also start looking at over here is the intelligent data, which is what I call the, par the parameters, or I call it intelligent data. And you'll see why I call it that in a little bit. And there's two types of intelligent data. There's the designer data, which we saw earlier, which is the characteristic data. Why is that important? so that you can make intelligent decisions about going into the library, find the part you want, and putting it down. The intelligent data of the purchasing is primarily to get that thing out the door. 
your fabrication, your assembly, and most importantly, your bill of materials. And then there also needs to be a unique component name. And why is this important? Because if there's two different databases, and what I mean by that is there's usually a PLM system the purchasers are using, and there's also the engineering library that you guys are using where you're keeping your parts. The only way that they're going to talk to each other is they've got to have a unique component name that are shared by both systems. And by having that, then Altium can actually relate one database to another. Okay. And I'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end over here. So these are the things that you want to have, the features of a good library. It's beyond just symbols, footprints, and 3D. Yes, you need them, but you'll find out more and more that this area up here is really critical. Okay. Okay. And in fact, to kind of reiterate this over here, if you really think about it, this is what we need as the designers. Okay. And this is where we've always focused because we need to get our job done. But what I'm, what I'm claiming is that we also not, we need to start changing our focus over here this environment over here because even though our intelligent data is different from the purchasing intelligent data, they still have a primary interest in it. So for example, they purchase a part and they look at the part on their system and it has a description and it matches your description that you have based on your, the characteristics of the library. That's a verification check. So it may not be their primary data, but it's certainly something that they can use to verify that the library and the request that they're putting in for that part match. Uh, the intelligent data that the purchasers have, is that your primary information? No, you're most interested in, in having uh, the circuit completed with the right components, but the uh, primary, their, their primary data, which you'd be looking at, the lead types and those kind of things, if you're looking at that, you're helping them along by making sure you pick parts that you know that they can purchase. So that's where the intelligent data comes in, and it's vital to both of you, but you have different interests in it. Okay? Now, I've mentioned this thing, intelligent data, many times. It's really critical, and I've kind of summarized this already in the prior slides. It allows designers to make informed decisions. If it's in the library, you can make a good decision about the part you want to use. And then the generation of the bill of materials, because this is where the link between the design and the purchasing begins, where the rubber meets the road, and it requires 100% accuracy. And I put this statement down here below because I've had arguments with purchasers in prior jobs about, well, we got 90% of your parts, and sometimes you don't realize that, well, you know, we need to have everything in order to build a complete circuit. Okay, so these are the two things that we need to have. And this is what I've seen in a lot of companies, and I think it happens still to this day. And really want to show you what happens when you don't have a good library set up. So you're a designer, you get a job, say, hey, we've got to get going over here, we've got a tight schedule. It's always a tight schedule, right? So you get in there, and you don't really have a central library. So you start pulling things from Altium's content library. And maybe you've got some stuff from prior projects. And a buddy of yours has got a certain part. And a lot of times, you're also building parts on the fly. And you're trying to get through this as quickly as possible because there's schedules to be met. So you get through this, and then you move over to the design process or the, foot, the PCB process. Same problem again. You probably didn't create the footprints, or the footprints are um, all over the plate, so you're again creating things on the fly to get through the PCB design. All right, then, finally got through the PCB design, you throw it to the purchasers to get it out the door, to fabrication. Ah, oh, you can breathe a sigh of relief, right? And now, you go over to the bill of materials, and you draw it up in Excel manually by hand. Okay, and that may take you about a week or so. You submit it to the designer, and you think that all is well, but I have news for you. That's a guaranteed way to basically respin, if not sync a design. Okay, if you're operating that manner over there, you've got two major issues. The first one over here is that if you're manually creating a bill of material, um, there's just too many opportunities for error. Just fat fingering things, forgetting things, copy and pasting the wrong things. And even if you did do this right, let's say that you cross checked it and you're really you really that kind of guy who dots the i's and cross the t's, you still have this issue over here because when you hand that bill of material over to the purchasers, there are factors that they have to deal with that you don't necessarily deal with. You know, a lot of people know about Rojas, and they may know about Reach, but there's another one like Conflict Mineral. There could be trade compliance issues. There could be ITAR things. There, you may have picked a part that may work great, but you can't export it because it's on the ITAR list. All right, so they may come back to you and say, sorry, this isn't going to work. And if this is an FPGA or some really large pin part, You've got instantly a week to two weeks worth of rework on that. You're going to have to tear up a schematic, and you're going to have to tear up a decent section of your printed circuit board to replace a large pin item. Okay, that means scrapping of boards. 
That means uh, cost, you know, uh, post changes over here. If it's smaller components like blue wires, dead bugs, lead lifting, oh, you've probably seen it all before. And in the end, you've got a lot of cost overruns and delays. So when you're working in this process over here, you're taking a bet. And that bet is a $10,000 bet that you're going to hit it right the first time. So according to the Aberdeen Group, that on average a respin costs this amount of money in terms of the labor uh, that, that your company's putting forth, the labor that you may be paying out to the uh, manufacturer uh, to make, make this board again, and for scrap material. And you're not, this does not account for lost market window time. Okay? So if you're working in this flow that I just mentioned over here, you're taking on a very big bet and the odds are really stacked against you. So, we have to get out of the mindset, and this, this happens all the time, and I see it all the time, we're so pressured to get through it so quickly that we find that we seem to have time to always do it over, right? There's never enough time to do it right, but there's always enough time to do it over. And that's a, it's a tough mindset to live in time and time again. And we want to get into this mode of dirt foot, that's what we used to call it in the scouts, do it right the first time. Okay? So, what does it mean by doing it right? the first time. So here's the flow that I believe provides for that first pass success. You build a library and it's got intelligent data in it. When you take that part or you're going through the library, you search it, you say, wow, I've got the part right here, here's all the information, I'm going to use that part. You place it down in Altium. Now whether you're using symbol-centric libraries, the vaults, component, uh, any type of library Altium provides, that intelligent data travels with the component. It stays with the part. Then you create a bill of material at the end of the schematic design. And you didn't even have to write it up in Excel because all that intelligent data traveled all the way to the bill of material. The bill of material pretty much created itself. So while this is being handed off to purchasing, you start working on your PCB design. And now you and purchasing are working in parallel. And by you guys working in parallel, they'll tell you if there's issues over here. But at least you can deal with those now rather than having to stop the fabs or scrapping boards. right? And so by the time you're done with this, the result is that all the documentation is ready to go. Your assembly is ready to go. Your fabrication is ready to go. Your bill of material is ready to go. And here are all the great benefits that you got by doing this particular flow, as I mentioned in the process earlier. Okay? And it's really possible through a good library. Okay? And then some, just some other statistics to throw uh, to you from the Aberdeen Group. 83 best-in-class electronics development companies, they have a formal component management system. Okay. And then they've even found decreases in development time, 11% decreases in product cost when they've had a good library. So these are the statistics that the Aberdeen Group uh, came across uh, when they were talking to these companies about uh, libraries and, uh, and their configuration management. Okay. So I, I've thrown out this term intelligent data enough times. Let's take a deeper look at what this is. Intelligent data is nothing more than what Altium calls parameters. And what's a parameter? It's really just a name and a value. So for example, part number, which is the name, and then the value is whatever the number you want to give it. Okay? And if you take a bunch of these things and you pull them together, this is what builds a bill of material. So it sounds pretty simple, but there's some caveats that we want to understand. Now the first thing you're thinking is, oh, that's great, but what do we need to do to start? Well, let me give you this list over here. Because this list is pretty much the same list that if you're working, if you're, let's say, the librarian and, you're at, and your guys are saying, I need parts, this is the, pretty much the same list you would ask from them anyways. You need to have a unique part number. As I mentioned earlier, it's the way you relate between two different databases. And it also allows you to separate off the manufacturer's numbers because there could possibly be out there two different manufacturers with the exact same part number. And you really want to have a unique part number. And Altium Designer, if you have two parts that have the exact same, let's say, part number, Altium's only going to see the first one on the list. And it's going to always ignore the second one. Okay? So that's, that's why you want to have a unique part number. You, of course, you'd want to have a manufacturer's part name, uh, a manufacturer's part name and the company's name itself. Obviously, you want to buy it from the company that makes it. The description field, I'm going to talk about this more in a few moments because this is actually very critical. I actually spent three months dealing with description fields at one company. Okay? And I'll, I'll explain why that's really important. Your graphical links, uh, even in symbol-centric libraries, you actually have these links. It's just being presented to you in a GUI format. But in the database, you would actually provide its name, you provide the symbol library and its path, and the same thing for the footprints. And then the last thing is you've got data sheets. And I call this the proof of existence. Right? So if someone wants this part, well, prove it to me. Well, here's the data sheet. Well, that's what I need. Because in the end, a lot of companies don't even want the symbol or the footprint from their designers. They just want all this information in the data sheet, 
and then they go off and build the symbol and the footprint so that they know that everything is uniform. Okay, that's one of the biggest problems I see with most libraries is that everybody draws something a different way and as a matter of fact they, re they duplicate the same thing. There's 20 different resistors when all you need to have is one resistor template. And that's another nice feature of database libraries. So uh, just providing really the intelligent data over here is enough to get a good library going and the rest, the graphic stuff, falls into place. Okay. I talked about the description parameter briefly. Let's get into it a little deeper. It is a human readable summary of the component. I, had to put, I just had to read that out because it's so key. That is the definition of it. It has to be human readable and in particular it needs to be what I'll call complete and it needs to be searchable. Now the company I worked for, this larger company, had 106 columns of information. Now I could have pieced together a component based off of looking through those 106 columns. But if they, because they had a decent description column, I only had to look for the description column. I didn't have to look in the 105 other uh, columns. Okay. So here's a library. Believe it or not, it's one that we're developing here at 9.connect. So I'm going to mention a little bit more here uh, in this presentation towards the end and next week as well. But it's a library that we're developing here that we're trying to make available to our customers. And you can see an example of this description field. And what's nice about this description field is it's complete meaning that if I just look at this, I don't care about this other information over here. I know that this is a resistor with 0 ohms, 1 tenth watt, 0603. Okay? In fact, and some of these even have a, a percentage over here as well. Right? I mean, 0 ohm won't have a tolerance. So, but the fact of the matter is that it has all the information I need to make an intelligent decision about this. It's very searchable and it's very complete. If, if I had to look through all these other things over here, I would have to spend quite a bit of time trying to piece together what that part's all about. And a lot of times, uh, I wouldn't be able to tell much about it. The, pin, the part number means nothing to me. That's just a random number we assign. Uh, it, it's great to know it's a resistor symbol, and it's great to know it's got this footprint, but I wouldn't be able to extract anything else out if this was all I had in my database. So you can see how important the description field is. Okay? Now, that was for a resistor, and this is why I spent some time doing this. There really has to be different description fields for different components. So a capacitor's description field jumped over here. The description field for capacitors not going to be the same thing as a resistor. So a capacitor, for example, doesn't really use wattage. It uses a voltage limit. It, uh, someone who's doing a capacitor wants to know if it's polarized or non-polarized. Someone who's using a capacitor wants to know what material. Is it ceramic or is it another material? Like tantalum, right? So th those would be different for capacitors is for resistor. And that's why, again, I go back to this idea that you really need to have a librarian who can kind of maintain this and develop this as it's going along. Okay, uh, it's if you if you everybody just makes a contribution on their own, which I jokingly call libraries by democracy, you're going to get this. Okay, this is useless unfortunately, but this comes from a real component. Altium built this for their nano board, so I took it and I looked at its bill of material. So the comment helps me out to some degree, but the description field is practically useless. All I know is that it's a resistor, and this is what will happen if everybody's making their contributions and you don't have someone maintaining the library. They're going to have their own ways of doing it, and then it becomes very difficult to search, or it's going to be missing data. Okay. So that's why the description field is, is vitally important, that it's organized and that someone maintains that. Okay. In addition, what about other parameters? Well, in fact, I would recommend that even though you may have a description field that has this text string in here, you may want to break up each and every single one of these into their own parameters. And Altium's cool with that. You can make parameters until you're blue in the face. You can have a thousand different parameters. Okay? And there's a, there is some use to that. Okay? So, and the reason why you'd want to do this over here is primarily what I'll call cascading searches. It makes it really easy to find things in the database based off of each one of these pieces of information. Uh, whereas the description field, you're going to be limited to whatever at the beginning of it. So if, you, if I was going to do this, basically I have my description field here, I would have a separate parameter for, that was just called component, so I could search whether it was a res or capacitor, diode, IC, a value, okay, of course the value could be anything, it could be ohms or uh, farads, henrys, you know, those type of things. The footprint again is important, and then even your tolerances, your wattage, and some of these would be blank. So for example, a capacitor probably wouldn't really use a wattage over here, and that's okay because in the end, you just want to be able to break up this data and use it. The description field will capture this in string format, but this will capture it in individual things. And just to give you an example of the power of that, if you are using a database library, this doesn't work for symbol-centric libraries, 
But if you're using a database library, you can actually take each one of those columns and you can cascade it. So you can first start with a value, then you can break it down to a footprint. And in this case, just to show it, I could have even broke it down to pin count if there was actually different pin counts as well. So it allows me to search it by breaking it down. And so the more granular you make it, where you say, well, let's put a, a column in there that determines whether this is through hole or surface mount, for example. Well, now you can split the database up and search it that way. Uh, you got your value, you got your footprints, you got your tolerances. All that can be done and cascaded down to help it make it very easy to search this. So when you're looking for that part and you've got 5,000 parts, you can find it really quickly. Okay. Now, there's a few other things. I said that a parameter is a name and a value, but it's amazing to me how quickly we can make a, a muck of it. So one of the things that has to be uniform is the name itself. Everybody has to agree to the same number because part underscore number does not equal part number, does not equal PN, does not equal P slash N. Altium's not smart enough to say that these are all the same and nor do I know of a way other than manually merging things together to tell Altium that these all mean the same thing. And what, why is that important? Because if everybody has their own way of describing a parameter, this is what's going to happen over here. So even though the data over here was related, if someone called it EX, another person called it example, then Altium is going to treat it as two separate columns. Okay? So again, this goes back to that dam idea. When you're building the dam, these are the kind of things you want to think about up front so that we don't start getting additional columns and then having to try to make this uh, exercise of moving things and changing them around. This is the kind of stuff you want to lock down from the very beginning. Okay? Now, also the values. So we talked about the names. Names should be uniform, but the values cause a lot of problems too. So the failure to keep consistent formats, number one, dead parameters. And what I mean by that is if you use this format, 2v5, I've seen this come around in the last 10, 15 years, and I like the format, but Altium can't read this. Altium would read this as only being two volts. It would drop anything after the V. Okay, so be careful of that aspect of it. And then it can become very difficult to sort or search. And what do I mean by that? Well, let's take a look at this example. It's a 100 picofarad capacitor. And look at all the ways we can write this. Okay. And that's why it's really important that at the very beginning everybody agrees that, hey, look, we're going to use the suffix format, or we're going to use the exponential format, or we're going to use the marking standard. Whatever way you want to do this, you can do it, but it's got to be consistent across the board. Otherwise, the search becomes useless. Okay. Now, you're probably saying, okay, I've got all these parameters all over the place, and yeah, you've talked about the, you know, there's the designer side of things, there's the purchaser side of things. Well, how do we kind of organize this? Okay. And what I've seen is that there's really two different types of library structures. I'll call it the single database where everything is being put into one large database, usually under a PLM. Then there's the dual database where you've got a PLM and an engineering library. So a lot of times this kind of forms because <clears throat> excuse me, the, uh, the PLM or the supplier stuff came about as one, as one system and the engineering library came about as another system and that's how they always kind of, kind of formed or the PLM system's always been there and now you're trying to create a library and what you'll find is that sometimes it's really hard to work into an existing PLM. So let's take a, a look at both the single and dual databases for a moment over here. So the single database, what's its advantages? Number one, everything's in one place. Grand unification of everything across the board in the company. And it does, do, do, it does a pretty good job with what I'll call synchronization issues because Let's face it, if you've got data in one system and you have data in another system, there's usually an overlap of data and it's really hard to keep that stuff synced up. So if you have a single database, you don't have to worry about that syncing issue. Uh, it doesn't resolve all synchronization issues, but it does a pretty good job of having to deal with that to begin with. Where are the disadvantages of this? Okay. Uh, this disadvantage of a single database, first and foremost, uh, you're forcing everybody to one size fits all. And if you're going to do this, this works really well if the PLM is being implemented and everybody has input into that implementation. Uh, it, as I mentioned earlier, it's really hard if someone's already got a PLM system and it's been used by purchasing and finance for years, it's really hard to get the engineering side into that because let's face it, that PLM has now been geared for the financial side and generally what I have found in the past is that there's a fine balance between engineering and business because they mix like oil and water. So if that database has already been primarily dedicated to the financial side of things, it becomes very difficult to make it an engineering one as well. So if you're thinking about that from the start, you need buy-in and you need input from all aspects, the financial guys, the purchasing guys, and the uh, design guys. 
You still need to keep the graphics external, not a major issue, but just realize that the PLM is not all encompassing. It still needs to re reference things that are outside um, of, the, of the system itself. As I mentioned earlier, and same thing with the one size fits all, you've got to have a strong collaboration between engineering and purchasing. I have found in a lot of companies that these two organizations are absolute loggerheads with each other and it's very unfortunate. And I'm just going to say this here right now that if you're in a company where you're where you, the engineering or the design groups and the purchasing groups are working in harmony, buy them some donuts and thank them for what uh, they provide you because when they're not in harmony, they actually cause uh, this, this, uh, this functionality between the two groups actually causes delays. Uh, and it does happen, in the larger the companies they are, they have different objectives with each other and they tend to go to loggerheads, which is unfortunate. But uh, if you can do a strong collaboration, then a single database will possibly work for you. Uh, the designers will need access to the system. Again, if it's an existing PLM, that does provide heartburn to both the purchasers and the finance people because like, oh, now there's more people that's going to uh, tax the system because it's got to do more. Um, it's got to basically handle more uh, requests and queries and searches and so on and so forth. So I don't think it's really a, a huge issue, but a lot of times that's what they'll complain about, saying, oh, you're pulling all of the, the, the processing time away for all your stuff as well. I don't, I don't think it's really a big issue these days, but it's something that they'll use uh, to try to keep you off their systems. Uh, the components must be entered before they exist in the bill of materials. Now, companies that have a policy about orphan parts, and what do I mean by orphan parts? That means that they won't allow parts in their PLM unless they belong to a bill of materials. If they won't allow orphan parts, single databases just won't work. Okay? And then you have to go to the concept of a dual database. Dual databases, so what are the advantages? Well, two different databases or two different groups. In one sense, that's a good thing because the engineers have their needs, the purchasers have their needs. Same thing, you've got administrators for each database. That means you're not trying to trace down the purchasing guy who's you know, trying to run the whole thing for everything. You've got a local guy who can try to get things done for you pretty quickly. Okay? And then the component can be entered into the design library long before it gets into the purchasing system, which is what happens anyways. Right, you're making a design, well who's the first person to come up with a new part? It's the designer. And guaranteed, pretty much every single design you're going to do, there's probably a new part in it. Otherwise your designs are not advancing forward and your product line is getting stale. So that's just a part of the engineering life, right? New parts will be designed and obviously they got to reside somewhere. They generally reside in the engineering or design libraries to begin with. So what are the disadvantages? Well, there, you get kind of this, um, this awkward situation where the engineering library is, well, I'll say, ahead of the PLM because it's got parts that the PLM doesn't even know about. But the PLM is the master of the data. So if you're on a design and you want to know which parts have been in production, you really want to know what's going on with the PLM because that's the one that knows the status of the components. So it's good that the engineering library is ahead, but this is where you really want to make things sync up with each other. And then there's, there can also be gaps in the vetting process. The one company I worked at, there was a three to six month gap between a new part being added in and then finally it being officially entered into the system as a production ready part. Okay? And I, I would tend to believe that by the time everybody touched it, there was well over $2,000 in labor um, touching that one component. Okay? Just verifying it, making sure it's qualified. They did a lot of export stuff, so they had to do all the trade compliance things. So by the time that new part got through the system, there was a big gap in the, uh, between the engineering library and the PLM, and there was a lot of people who touched it, and in a lot of cases, it, they find, oh, we can't use that part, and there would be a big scramble to try to find a substitute that would work for them. Okay. So I've thrown a lot at you over here in very little time, and maybe you guys, some of you may have been surprised. I thought he was going to talk about footprints and 3D and, and symbols and all that stuff, and I'll kind of talk about that next week. But as I said, my experience is really where the biggest problems lie with libraries is intelligent data. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, wow, how are we going to handle this? What are we going to do about it? So again, I'll give you a couple of bullet points to consider. The first one is that if you're not signed up for next week's webinar, come join us for it. Uh, if you're using a symbol-centric library, take a look at what a database library can provide for you. If you're doing a database library, see what the Altium Vault can do for you. Uh, because the Altium Vault answers a lot of issues that the database library cannot answer, and I'll go into depth on, to, on, on what those are. Uh, if you're uh, feeling gung-ho about a database library and saying, hey, I, I think it's time for us to take a look at this. We want to see what this is all about. About two years ago, myself and a former Altium colleague of mine by the name of Iman Jabri, we sat down and we put together a 20-minute video on YouTube 
on uh, how to basically set up a very basic database library. So if you've ever been curious how to make that even work, uh, once you get it started, then you can see easily how these things are pulled together. This search for database library in Altium on YouTube, you'll find it, 20 minute video, and it'll get you started. Uh, as mentioned earlier by Jason, we do have coaching services, and I'd be probably one of the coaches if you guys are interested, if you talk to uh, one of our sales reps, and I'll put that uh, slide up in a moment. I'm more than happy to get you started on those things where you need some guidance, where, where things you want to do, what, how you want to set up your parameters. As I mentioned earlier, we have this thing that's called the uh, Nine Dot Connects Library Box, and this is kind of a cool feature. This is not something that Altium is providing. It's not something that any of the other bars in the United States are providing as well. What we do is we have a fellow that works with us. He uh, does a lot of our PCB design services. And over time, he had found that a lot of companies he worked for uh, didn't have pretty good, the, the libraries were compromised or they weren't up to speed for what he needed to do very quickly. So over time, he built up his own library, parts that the customers needed. And it got to the point where he built up something that was really nice. And we said, hey, there are people that want to start off with a library that's already in existence. But if you buy this box from us, it's not just us dropping off a library and then wishing you the best. It also includes some coaching to make sure that once you've got that library and that you've got it installed and that you're using it, that you continue to maintain it. It's just like that vegetable garden. You can hire a bunch of landscapers one Saturday to go in there and make those, you know, clean up the yard and make it all look pristine. But if that's the only day they're going to be in there and they're not coming back again, well, over time it's going to fall apart unless that person who paid for those landscapers are going to uh, maintain that. So that's the way we're going to handle the library box over here.